Hi, everybody. My name is Lynn Sickwilland, and I'm a member of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Welcome to our webinar, Anxiety and ADHD, and our presenter is Jennifer Erickson. If you have a question after watching the webinar, you can send an email to webinars at adaa.org. And you can support ADAA by making a charitable contribution on the website. Okay, so let's get started and I'm happy to introduce uh, our presenter. Dr. Jennifer Erickson has a doctorate in health psychology as well as a master's in mental health counseling. She is a licensed professional counselor in both Virginia and Florida. She is a certified clinical anxiety treatment professional and a certified mental health integrative, integrative medicine professional. Jennifer has a private practice, anxiety and wellness counseling, where she focused on helping people recover from anxiety disorders, build executive function and learn skills to help with ADHD. Additionally, Jennifer is focused on helping people with health and wellness issues, such as living with medical illnesses, weight stabilization and health improvement. Now, let me turn it over to Dr. Erickson. So Lynn, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be on. I love speaking about anxiety and ADHD. Um, I started working in the specialty of anxiety almost a decade ago, and I have a, a huge passion for helping people with anxiety, simply because of the complexity of the world, the way we live, everything goes on. We, we don't necessarily have or are skilled or trained to have the coping skills necessary for today's environment. Um, as children, we're not taught how to balance and live with, again, the complexities of the world. And so for me, helping people with anxiety and change the way they think and the way they behave is, is just really rewarding. And it is ADHD or it is anxiety that actually led me to ADHD. So I'm gonna share a little bit and show how the two kind of go together. So first, I always love to clarify, um, here, let me move this over, to clarify the definition of anxiety. You're gonna find so many definitions out there about what is anxiety. And so this is Webster's, I pulled it off the um, dictionary and you can see there's kind of different tones to it, apprehensiveness, uneasiness, um, impending um, or anticipated illness, um, ab abnormal or overwhelming sense of apprehension, fear. So I highlighted a couple of the words, I'm not gonna read each one of these, but the words that you see, nervous, physical signs, which again, that physical stuff, tension, sweating, pulse rate, heart rate, breathing, mentality, doubt, fear, or uneasiness. These are all at the heart of how most people feel about anxiety. And it gets really complex and complicated to talk to sometimes because again, people are feeling this, especially from the neck down. So I came up with a simpler definition. And this is what I use in my practice. Anxiety is a physiological response to excessive worry. So in other words, it is the body's physical response, whether adrenaline, cortisol, due to overthinking, overworrying, and overfearing. And that might sound really simplistic, but in our world, a lot of times at the core of anxiety is a fear, right? Now, this might, be, this might come on fast. There could be a trauma, so I'm not dismissing traumas, or a medical condition that causes a, an acute response. But generally speaking, anxiety in our world today is cortex related. It is thinking, it is cognitive. Um, it is a pattern of thinking about something over and over and over again. Even something that starts as young as in childhood, um, a concept that we don't understand because kids are smart. However, to understand again, the complexity of the world, it takes a few years. Um, in fact, I often share an example of when I was younger, easily nine, 10, I would see a commercial and it was for a toothpaste and said four out of five dentists recommend whatever this toothpaste was. And I would sit there and stare at the TV going, why doesn't the fifth dentist like it? What's going on with the fifth dentist? Does he know something? Is there something going on? And I couldn't stop focusing on why this fifth dentist didn't like it. Of course, I was too young to understand statistics, marketing, any of that. So again, it shows that even from a young age, we can get a thought and hold on to it. And that over time can change our perception or our view of the world or ourselves. 
And so eventually that thinking can cause a physiological response, right? I start to worry, what is somebody thinking? I start to wonder, um, am I good enough? I start to worry, the word judgment comes up a lot or failure. And when we trigger that physiological response, we get very distressed by it. My heart is racing. My lungs are, you know, I'm breathing deeper or shallower. I'm trembling, you know? And so again, we get very fearful of our body. And so again, anxiety has a huge impact on the world. Now let's take a pause from anxiety and let's talk about ADHD for a minute. So I pulled up our DSM um, definition. It is neurodevelopmental. It is a neurodevelopmental disorder. This is important, neuro, neurological. It's really important that a lot of people think, don't think about this in such a medical term, right? Because it is psychologists, therapists, social workers, we're the ones that talk about it because it has a behavioral output, right? Or a cognitive output, but it is neurological. And so that's important to remember. But attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a disorder with its onset in early childhood. Again, some people don't realize that. I'm going to explain why. But almost everybody that I that I work with did rec does now look back and recognize that it was there, but it was just missed. But it's an onset in early childhood and is characterized by symptoms of hyperactive inattention and impulsivity that er interfere with daily and occupational functioning. It's funny because when you talk about ADHD, a lot of people think, well, yeah, I know that boy that was sat in the back of the class that bounced all over the place. We know he had ADHD. And that's what people think about. That person that sat in the back of the class or had to sit in front of the teacher who bounced all over the place, was always touching stuff, always getting in trouble. That's what ADHD looks like. So the problem is a lot of people don't really understand what true ADHD is. So ADHD itself has three components, um, the way the DSM is set up. We do have the hyperactive impulsivity person, what we call the, the hyperactive. But we also have inattentive, the former attention deficit disorder, ADD, right? And then we actually have the combined type. And this gets really interesting because again, we're all used to that person that bounced, but inattentive. A lot of people aren't used to that. And the reason they get missed is because those people are, those children are accomplishing things. This week, I could get all my homework done. This week, I did what the teacher told me to do. This week, I happened to sit still. But next week, who knows? Maybe I just can't do it. I sit there, I stare at my work, I think about it, and I just can't get myself to do it. And even that combined type, one week, I'm a little bit going, going, going. Next week, I just can't do it. In fact, a lot of the clients that I work with, often we refer to the term of their brain also almost being soaked in molasses, that it's thick, it can't go. And so people are just like, why can't I go? What's going on? The problem that comes then is, while well, that hyperactive child gets identified, whether they get treatment at a young age or how they get treatment or how that happens, that's one thing. And I meet some of those people as adults because they'll come in and go, you know, I'm older now. I understand. I definitely have this. How can I improve executive function skills? What are some better treatments? But the interesting thing is, again, going back when I first started working with anxiety, I would meet people who no matter what we did seem to get stuck. They could do a few things and then couldn't do a few things. And throughout the conversation or throughout ruling out as a therapist, me ruling out things that are going on, ADHD would come up and they would need to be tested. And eventually I started seeing this pattern that some of my most stuck clients actually had ADHD inattentive or ADHD combined type. They didn't even know they had it because again, back in school, they could some weeks get things done. They could do really good in English, but not really good in math. They could play sports, but then they couldn't get their homework done. And so again, I'm a parent, I understand. It is hard to tell what's going on with your child when maybe 75% of the time they're doing really good and just this 25% they're not. But what happens is that voice, why aren't you working very hard this week? How come you're not motivated this week? What do we need to do to get you going? And that child is saying, well, I'm trying, I just can't do it. And again, the hard part, 
when they're children, they also have adolescence to deal with, right? The angst, the hormones, all that other stuff. So sometimes it really is hard to tell. So that's the problem. And so if we go back, if we start in childhood, executive function skills, right? So again, switching topics. So hopefully this is, this is all making sense. I'm building up to something here. But I wanna talk about executive function skills. So what are they? They are the skills that are mental health processes that enable us to plan, focus, remember instruction, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. This is a, an example I borrowed from somebody, it's awesome. Just like an air traffic control system at a busy airport, how they safely manage the arrivals and departures of many aircrafts on multiple runways. The brain needs this set of skills to filter distractions, prioritize, ta prioritize tasks, set and achieve goals, and control impulses. That's executive function. We have to have these, these abilities to think critically, to analyze, to dissect, right? And so what happens again, we don't focus on these skills in childhood. Part of what we're doing even in kindergarten, you know, when the teacher says, I want everybody to stop this work group and move and go over to this other group, or we're gonna switch from math to English or from, you know, um, blocks to reading, whatever. The reality is that teacher is guiding them in executive function skills. Let's stop. Let's pause what we're doing and go eat lunch. Let's initiate something else or initiate cleanup, right? Again, high level skills. So more executive function skill information. This is by Dr. George McCloskey, wonderful researcher. I love his training programs. He's defined or his group has defined 33 executive function skills in these seven different clusters. Um, so it's really great. And I will say researchers debate exactly how many executive function skills there are. So that can be debated. But what I'm here to talk about are the ones they all agree with. They agree that ADHD directly affects focus and sustaining that, right? So do I stay focused on something and not be able to break that focus? I'm over sustaining, right? Or I think about something for a second and I look over here and it's gone. I can't sustain that focus. Also that ability to monitor and modulate. Am I using my outdoor voice inside? Am I playing a video game and I'm dying to go to the bathroom, but I won't stop? So I'm not monitoring my own needs. I'm not monitoring my own interactions. That inability to, again, self-regulate. So ADHD directly affects um, self-regulation. You know, it's focus, that working memory, that ability, instant gratification, right? That inability to monitor and modulate ourselves. So that we all know, and most researchers all agree. And again, this starts in childhood. We're born, unless there's a cognitive deficit in birth, we're born with all having the ability for all of these. And they get better and better with age. But what if we can't practice, right? What if I can't initiate something else? What if I can't stop doing something? What if I can't correct myself? What if I can't prioritize because I'm so over-focused or I can't maintain my focus for more than a few minutes and I switch topics? So then what happens in, in early childhood is we don't build on those executive function skills. We don't self-regulate. We need instant gratification because we can't, our impulsivity is too high. I have to shop right now. I have to do this right now. That can even look like OCD, right? I have to do this right now. I have to check this, I have to do this. Or very type A personality. So you see, this is kind of the confusion with even ADHD and personality types. Or um, again, just that natural way people live. So it's executive function skills are really important. They start young and they get more refined with age. So ADHD and executive function. So imagine this funnel, right? Just like the airline, we have all these things that we have to do today, but I have to funnel it through a decision-making apparatus within my brain. I need my working memory, impulse control, again, decision-making. If I can't focus, then all of these things might flood through my funnel at one time and I never get anything done. Or that funnel gets stuck and I know I've got to do all these things. But again, it's like my brain is on molasses. 
I just can't seem to get it done. I know I've got to do it. I make a plan to get up early and do it. And then when the time comes, I forget that funnel closes. And that's what it's like for people with ADHD. And what eventually that leads to is self-doubt. Can I get this done tomorrow? Can I remember to do this? It also leads to low self-acceptance. Everybody's disappointed in me. I'm letting people down. I forget birthdays. I show up 30 minutes late. There's all this negative stuff. And that negative stuff started when they were young. Again, not maliciously, not with any type of judgment, just again, parents or teachers. Why couldn't you get this done this week? Why did you forget? And so people start to have an inner voice that is really nervous and fearful of the next person they're going to disappoint or the next person that they're going to upset. And then they even lose confidence in themselves. So again, the impact of ADHD on executive function and then leading to, leading to anxiety. I have a task to do in my life, like call the doctor and make an appointment. But if I'm hyper, again, squirrel brain, right? I do everything else except make the appointment. I start the laundry, although I might forget that it's in there because now I'm vacuuming or oh, now I've got to go grocery shopping. Now I got to do this. By the time I get home, well, those clothes have been sitting in the washer, never got them in the dryer, never emptied the vacuum cleaner, and I didn't make the appointment, right? That becomes, again, a daily function for some people. Or I have a task to do in my life and I have inattentive. I forget, I'm gonna sit down here on the couch and relax for just five minutes, but before I know it, two hours pass. And I didn't even notice that time had passed. And now it's too late to schedule. Or I know those dishes are in the sink. I told my partner that I would take care of them, but I forgot. And so again, because of ADHD interferes with decision-making, planning, again, all those executive function skills, it can be really hard to then exercise those executive function skills. Just like physical muscles, we need cognitive muscles to be used repeatedly. In fact, what I tend to tell people, there's a saying out there um, that people like to use in the world, 21 days creates a habit. For somebody with ADHD, it could be more like 121 days. And so it's not that people can't do things. It just, it takes so much more effort, so much longer. ADHD is not reflective of intelligence. And this is why we can see even young kids who get straight A's when they get their schoolwork done. It's not reflective of intelligence. It is a neurological issue with working memory with exec and it interferes with executive function skill. So again, because I cannot complete tasks, I may be disappointing others. I miss my own appointments. I don't get things done. I begin to worry and I worry and I worry about what else might go wrong. And additionally, people are telling me that I'm upsetting them. So not only am I bothering myself, I'm bothering others. And so I'm always feeling judged. I'm feeling like a failure. My self-confidence is shot. That's eventually how somebody with ADHD can develop anxiety. So ADHD and anxiety, right? This is where it all really starts to come together. Life happens in a very normal way. So I'm not even saying anything major or traumatic is happening, just life is happening. But because my inner voice is so critical, I get so hyper-focused on my, my self-critical thinking, I can't focus, I can't self-accept. I struggle to shift thinking, right? So again, I'm very focused, especially depending on whether I'm hyper or inattentive. Am I over-focused on critical thinking? Or can I just not focus on good pros and cons? I, it's hard to use effective coping skills. I'm stuck in that place of worry. And again, like I talked about in the beginning, that physiological response. I'm now constantly having, right, the racing heart, the trembling, the breathing, the lightheadedness, nausea, weak limbs. And a lot of people tell me when I see them that they feel like they're going to die. In fact, Probably more than 50% of my clients that I work with see me after they've been to the emergency room, after they've been to the cardiologist or the neurologist. And those professionals say, you need to talk to somebody about your anxiety, that they are physically okay. And because this experience is so physically draining and scary, people get stuck in their own fear of their own physiology. 
And that's anxiety, right? Again, that excessive fear, the physiological response to excessive fear. And so that's really hard. When you are terrified of your own body, what happens if can I, am I gonna pass out? Am I gonna end up on YouTube because somebody, you know, I pass out and I, somebody video records me. What if there's nobody there to help me? And so there's then that, that fear, that core feeling all started because in this case of potentially a neurological issue. So the cycle for an undiagnosed or untreated person with ADHD is this making difficult, making it's difficulty. They have difficulty making decisions, uncompleted tasks or failures, criticism from others or self, lower self-confidence, more life events, and more difficulty making decisions. And it just keeps repeating. So I only work with adults and that tends to be when I meet people is they've been living this way. Some of them since early childhood, some they were able to manage it through middle and high school. But once they hit college or a trade school or were just living on their own, the complexities again of life became so much more apparent. Now they have, it's not just schoolwork, or sports, but now they have bills to pay. They might have classes to attend or training to go to, or just so many more people they're in, interacting with at a job, or again, what shift do they work? And especially if they have a job where different, potentially different shifts, it becomes again, overwhelming. So the treatment of, of the benefits of treating ADHD, it's one, you can learn to strengthen those executive function skills. And this is the benefits of working with a therapist, right? The ther that is as a therapist, whether psychologist, ther you know, professional therapist, social worker, it doesn't matter, all of us, we are trained to help people communicate. We are trained to help people change their perspective. We are trained to help people set boundaries and again, utilize those executive function skills. So ADHD treatment benefits, one, you strength strengthen those skills, you improve decision-making, you learn or improve life, positive life coping skills. You improve your self-confidence, including self-acceptance, which is so important. People don't talk enough about just accepting who you are. If you have ADHD, it's, it, it is an, a neurological issue. It is accepting it no different than people accept, I have high blood pressure or I have a thyroid issue or all the other you know, conditions or issues or diseases out there, or just personality types. I'm a type A, I have this, or I have that. Again, self-acceptance. Improve communication skills and boundary setting. So ADHD treatment, again, this starts with a screening. Now, PCPs can do it, therapists can do it. There are a lot of people who will screen. Um, if screening supports it, getting them fully tested. Um, <clears throat> there is medication assisted therapy if, if recommended by your medical doctor or your psychiatrist. Then of course, from a therapist, CBT and executive function therapy. Dr. It, Erickson, can I ask um, what the uh, testing generally looks like? Yeah, so for adults, actually it's pretty simplistic. Um, researchers today have found that uh, testing for adults is actually can happen in one session um, it tend, usually tends to include a clinical interview, and I'm going to get more into that. And then there are a couple uh, highly accepted uh, assessments. So like the Connors um, assessment for ADHD, and I believe Brown is the other really good one. For children, it is a little bit more in-depth because children, again, don't have the self-awareness to be able to speak to some of their what's going on. So there, so there are psychologists who do really just children, and then there are psychologists who do more just adults. Um, some do both, but children, it does take a lot more. Sometimes it can take two or three sessions. There's parent or teacher observer portions. Um, and then with adults, there doesn't need to be all that extra stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, with that. Now, the, the, here's the interesting part with adults, because adults do learn to cope in some ways, right? we learn to create function around the dysfunction. So what I mean by that is I can turn my calendar on and set a calendar appointment for taking out the garbage. So if somebody said, well, do you have problems doing daily functions? Well, no, 
Well, yeah, you really do. It's you have calendars set up, you have sticky notes, you might have your significant other reminding you. So for adults, the interesting thing, and I do this testing, it's you have to rule out a lot of stuff. That clinical, in, clinical interview is just as important as the formal assessment because you are trying to rule out all the skills they have developed, whether they're you know, positive or negative skills, but all these skills that they've developed to work around their ADHD. Many times I meet people in their 40s, 50s, or 60s who are just now getting tested. What do you say to a partner or spouse who basically says, why aren't you using your calendar reminders and why aren't you, um, why aren't you doing the things you know you need to do to, to manage yourself? And that's, an, that's a great question. I actually, a lot of times, um, one, when I do uh, testing, I give my clients a full report, which actually tells them some of the skills that go with, or some of the issues that can go with each, whether it's hyperactive, inattentive, and I explain that these are kind of correlate with, with this type of ADHD, They're, my clients can actually invite their spouse in to even talk about that. And one of the, the things in, again, is the difficulty is, again, ADHD is neurological. So it is not a choice. And that I think is the most important thing is mm -hmm. that if people are not choosing to not do something, they're not choosing to forget, there's an issue with working memory. And some people have, have it more severely than others. And again, this is where medication assisted therapy can help bring in that focus. There's been a lot of, in fact, more clients that I talk to as adults prefer that or prefer that with retraining again, executive function therapy, again, that joint between medication and therapist. But in as a child, they they didn't necessarily care for medication as much. And there's there's a connection between that. But what I tell the spouse is, one, don't become their boss. Don't, don't drive in their line. That, so sometimes what happens is the partner of the person who has ADHD will start driving in their lane. Well, I'm mad that they won't wash the dishes. So I, I become their boss. I tell them when to do it. I tell them all this. But what I explain is if you help them too much, they can't develop skills right? They can't grow those executive function skills. So what I actually talk to my clients, spouses or family about is help them build the skills, but don't just chastise them. Again, this, there's no different than I can, no matter how hard I work, I cannot will my blood pressure to be appropriate, right? I, if I eat all the right stuff, if I exercise, if my blood pressure won't be right, no matter how much I think about it, I can't make it work. That's a medical issue. The same is for ADHD. It is neurological. No matter how much I will it, sometimes it can't work. Self-motivation does help self-regulation, right? So if I create rewards, but the person has to own, especially as an adult, has to own their life, has to drive in their lane and has to figure out, and that's what, the, the, what a therapist can do is, how do you build those executive function skills, especially the ones that aren't impacted directly by ADHD? How can we build those? And so again, spouse or, or partner, can you allow them time and space to build those skills? And then also figure out that no matter what, if they don't like doing the dishes, they're not gonna like doing the dishes. So if that's what you're looking for, you might be disappointed. Even ADHD or medication assisted therapy or a behavioral therapist, we can't make somebody love doing something they don't wanna do. So. That's when couples therapy or relationship discussions are, how do you do something that you don't even want to do? You don't like doing it. And again, that's a requirement of life, right? We all pay taxes. None of us like it, but we still need to do it. So there's some different conversations that are occurring of whether somebody's being given the space to rebuild their executive function. If they're being criticized for not liking something that most people don't like, you know, again, what is it in the conversation? But it really is teaching the, the family or the significant other that this is a neurological issue, that it's, again, not a choice. Thanks. Thank you. And so, again, going back to ADHD, that's why ADHD treatment is so powerful. Again, the medication-assisted therapy or medication does help ADHD win those, those areas that are directly affected, the focus, the sustain right, the working memory. And then behavioral therapy can help with rebuilding the executive function skill. 
an example of that. I have one client from years ago who just wanted to be able to stop, to be patient, to not have instant gratification. I think many of us can say that, right? I, if I want to buy something, I actually have the ability to pause and wait 24 hours to buy it. So that's the fun thing about executive function coaching is that we can find really simplistic ways to help. In her case, we broke a cookie in half. She loved her cookies. Husband managed the whole container. She had a cookie for breakfast, which released dopamine, got her excited. She loved that chocolate chip cookie, but she had to wait all day till dinner to get the other half. And so that practice of waiting, that discomfort, again, being okay with the body, being okay that you're kind of wanting that cookie, started building that executive function skill of inhibiting, of pausing. And so now that then led to, if I can control the cookies, I can control my shopping. I can control my emotional eating. I can control so many more things. So executive function teaching or coaching is so fun because people are really learning how to just really embrace the skills they want in their life. Same example, I worked with somebody years ago, inattentive, struggle to read. Very common, many people with ADHD can't sit still. But the goal was I'm going to make myself do it. Did it for 10 minutes and it was exhausting, but did it for 10 more, did it for 10 more, kept doing a little bit every day. And after a while, after a few months was reading a book in a week. So we really can, that's the beautiful thing about ADHD treatment is yes, it directly affects executive function, but we can build that executive function. And then here's the important thing, that therapist now has the ability to help that person shift their thinking. What, let's go back to now, now that you're managing your ADHD, how do you manage your worry? Can we shift the way you're thinking? Can we shift that perspective? Can we shift a different you know, point of view? And so in, a, in children, a lot of times we manage, their therapy is managed through dealing with some of their worry first. But for adults, we want to deal with the ADHD. There's so much going on. They have to be able to function and hold down a job. They want to be able to hold down relationships, pay their bills, go to their doctor. There's so much going on that if we can resolve and manage that ADHD first, sometimes that actually takes so much worry off the table that now they're, they have the space to work on self-confidence, self-acceptance. And that's really a huge thing. And that's why, again, I love doing um, ADHD therapy with somebody, especially when they believe their primary issue is anxiety. I love screening for that. In fact, part of my practice is I now screen everybody that comes to see me for ADHD, just to make sure, do we need to take that off the table or do we need to put it on the table? So that's, again, kind of this whole circle back. Sorry, it's the end of my slide. <laughs> um, but that, that is the, the, the kind of the cycle of, here we go. That is the cycle of how ADHD impacts anxiety and why it's so hard for people to change their anxious thinking with untreated or undiagnosed ADHD. Because that Dr. Erickson, do you feel that somebody, a consumer should seek, seek out somebody with expertise in uh, either ADHD treatment or executive function if they suspect that they or, the, or their family member has um, ADHD? I do think they should. Um, it is really, ADHD is a specialty. Um, and again, there's more people focused on children. There's less specialists focused on adults but adult ADHD looks different and adult ADHD looks different in women than in men or again, in, in different ages. So it is really important to find a person who is specialized in ADHD, who does a lot of training in it. Um, and interestingly um, out there, it can be hard to find much of my training is not only with researchers, but if actually that PCPs would take uh, provide, uh, family providers because I wanna also understand the, the medical side, what is the PCP being trained? And so it really is important to, to under, to, if you have anxiety and you believe you have ADHD, to actually seek somebody who is specialized in that combination area. Um, because 
for somebody who has AD, undiagnosed or untreated ADHD, no matter how much anxiety therapy we do, and I've had clients tell me this over the years, even with medication-assisted therapy for anxiety, they still just never feel right. They never get to that place. And that's because they've never still touched the ADHD. Um, I think that that's, that that's everything that I wanted to share. It's kind of a quick general circle of how the two go together. So I hope people out there kind of learn something about adults with ADHD or possibly untreated or undiagnosed ADHD and have anxiety. It is something to look at. Thank you so much, Dr. Erickson, for your presentation. And thanks for everybody for watching this webinar. These webinars are presented by the ADAA, which is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education like this webinar, practice, and research. Please take advantage of the amazing resources on the adaa.org. You'll find a great list of treatment providers by just clicking on find a therapist from the homepage, as well as a free peer-to-peer -peer online support group. 